November 8, 2006 will go down as a day of infamy for the Republican Party in the United States. Fed up with little apparent progress in Iraq and meager oversight of a failing White House, voters in state after state tossed out fawning Bush supporters and replaced them with Democrats promising something called change. What that means will evolve starting in January when the new leadership and freshman clash class takes their seats. In the meantime, let's talk about what happened Tuesday. Gary Byler was a chastened man on Tuesday, an attorney and former local GOP party chair. He has been here on many occasions defending Republicans. Now he can explain them to us. Vivian Page earned a return to On the Record with a wonderful performance about a month ago when we discussed blogs, a local CPA. She runs a liberal tinge blog that originates at her home in Norfolk. And I was stunned this morning to look out in my reception area and we had some miscommunication because I had wanted Bobby Scott to be here and didn't think he'd make it, but here he is. And now Bobby went from being sort of a backbencher for the last 12 years, really, uh, in the minority party as a congressman representing the 3rd District, which includes parts of Norfolk and Portsmouth and Peninsula all the way up toward Richmond. And now all of a sudden you're in the majority party and you, you were in that for two years, I guess, from 92 to 94, your first two years in Washington. And now uh, all of a sudden, you got a little bit of um, responsibility, correct? How's that going to change your life in Washington well, starting January? It'll be a lot busier, <clears throat> but the um, control that we have in, in the legislature will be tempered by the fact that there's still a Republican president. We had a Republican legislature with a Democratic president un under President Clinton, and when the majority got too far off course uh, and excluded the minority, the president could threaten a veto. Right. And that meant that there was, there was inclusion. Once the um, Republican president came in with the Republican legislature, there was just no restraint on the, uh, on the legislature. And big question, I think, in America right now, and the one that the Republicans were trying to raise a lot during sort of the last weeks of the campaign was, you cannot vote for these Democrats because you're going to get Nancy Pelosi as the Speaker of the House. Uh, she's been there for 20 years, so she's actually been there longer than you, so she's had opportunity to be on both sides of this thing. What kind of Speaker of the House is she going to be, and is she going to try to, as the Republicans seem to say, impose a liberal agenda on you guys? Well, when you use the labels, you, you, you're dis disconnected from the issues. And what's the liberal position on the budget? A uh, liberal position is that you balance the budget, create a surplus, and protect Social Security. Six years ago, we had enough of a surplus to actually pay the $4 trillion needed to pay Social Security for 75 years. The conservative position is you take that surplus, uh, pass unaffordable tax cuts, increase spending, and run up a deterioration in the budget of over $8.5 trillion before they start talking about the war. $300 billion on the war is $0.3 trillion eight and a half trillion dollar deterioration we cannot afford social security in the future without a radical change in direction uh... there is we pass things we allowed what we call paygo to pass we used to have a restraint on on uh, on 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 the budget called paygo if you come up with a new spending program you got to pay for some, you know, cut somewhere else or, or pay, for, pay it for it with, with with taxes if you want to cut taxes you gotta cut spending well, well gary was this part of the I mean, you're a conservative. You're a fiscal conservative. And he, like Rush Limbaugh said this week, I'm tired of carrying the water for these Republicans. Do you feel like you've been having to, and you and others have been having to carry the water for a party that had lost its way on what you consider to be conservative principles? Well, Joel, when you go from implementing the people's will and the desire's will, once you get into Washington, funny things happen. There are a lot of lobbyists up there, and there's absolutely no doubt that my party failed to deliver on the promises that they had made regarding physical restraint. And I wish Congressman Scott all the best with PAYGO mm -hmm. and anything we can do to restrain the federal spending. But what we don't want to do is to uh, solve the financial problem simply by raising taxes. And I think that that's going to be a self-defeating proposal. I do congratulate my uh, our, our friends in the new majority. And there's some, uh, there's some low-hanging fruit. There's some things such as the minimum wage increase, the negotiation with Medicare, that I think they can get done easily. The first hundred hours won't be a problem. It's the second hundred hours that they need to be careful of. Yeah, what do you think is going to happen up there? I think they're going to take on the, the as, as Gary says, the low-hanging fruit. We're going to take care of getting the minimum wage raised, as we should. We're going to take care of doing something about the lobbyists. But more importantly, we are going to move towards doing something about Social Security. There's no doubt that Social Security just hangs over us like a cloud, and we've got to resolve that problem. Part of the ways of doing that is looking at how we have given so much money away in tax cuts to the top,
1% of the folks in the country. I am all for the CPA. I'm all for fiscal restraint. I'm all for us figuring out a way to balance this budget. And one of the ways we've got to do that is we've got to take back and let everybody have some shared sacrifice about where, where we need to go. Well, 